Good evening. Thanks for being here again for another sermon. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you brought your Bibles. I hope you're ready to dive into the Word as I am tonight, and I hope that you, uh, I hope you've been in prayer for our brothers and sisters overseas, for the people affected by the hurricanes. All of these things should be in your prayers right now for our brothers and sisters who are going through very, very difficult times. Um, and I want to encourage you to make time for prayer, to make prayer a priority, and it not just to be a end of day or before a meal thing. No, it's something that's integrated into your life. So tonight, um, before we get started, let's go into a word of prayer. O oh, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to just ask that you would please be here with us tonight, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that your presence would be among us tonight, Lord, as we dive into your word, that you would help us to understand, Lord. Be with our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. They're uh, hiding for their lives. Be with our brothers and sisters in uh, Louisiana and along the coastline that have been ravaged by the hurricane. And be with the church, Lord, for it's so divided. And there are so many that are apostate. Please be with those that are yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. We're going to look at some scriptures that are talking about the cross and what it means for us in our life today and what it, what it symbolizes and what it is about. Go with me to Mark 8, 34 through 38. Mark 8, 34 through 38. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I make sure I will just read. Uh, and he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. See that the kingdom of God has come with power. So. Let's break this down. Let's start with the first little bit there. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Self-denial. The disregard for the flesh. Whoever wants to be a disciple of Christ must deny what they want or what they desire. That is radical thinking. That is something that is <laughs> causes deep consternation for those that are so indwelt with the world. Because it's, where, it's find, where they find their joy. It's where they find their purpose. It's where they find their identity. Their identity and their purpose and their joy is all wrapped up in the flesh. So for them to deny themselves of that would be complete denial of everything they hold true and hold dear to. And that's too much for them, for most people. See, the more that you love the world, the harder it is to deny the world. The more that you are involved in what the world is involved in, the harder it is to shed that weight. It can be done, though, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the bringing down of the veil, through giving eyes to see and ears to hear, and then seeing the true salvation that comes through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Now the second part of that is, and take up their cross and follow me. Somebody is not earthly minded if they're willing to take up an instrument of death and follow the one that led the way. 
Christ led the way. He was the example for us of what we should be doing and how we should be living. Denial of self. And that's what the cross is for. Christ's flesh was nailed to the cross. The perfect Christ, the blemish-free Christ, was nailed to the cross. We are not perfect. We are not blemish-free. And the cross is there for us to consistently, day in and day out, nail the flesh to it and the things of the world so we have our instrument of death with us. We have our instrument that helps us to die to the flesh and to the world. Take up your cross. Choose Christ and then follow him. Well, how do I follow Christ? Where's my cross? Pick it up. Turn from the world. Turn from the flesh. Turn from the things that make you who you are in this world and on this plane. It is not enough to just merely say, oh, I know Christ. What you ought to think is, does he know you? Are you denying yourself? Are you truly his disciple or are you just a fan? You're not a follower, you're a fan. A fan sits in the stands and applauds and appreciates what's going on, but they're not a part of the work. They're not a part of the, the day in and day out grind of what it means to be a true follower follower the cross it is the most precious truth to me what happened with the cross and with Christ and what was paid on it for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it Life, mortality, eternal. These are all things people wrestle with. Fear is a side effect. Anxiety is a side effect. The what if scenario played out in our minds over and over and over. If you denied yourself here, and you've picked up your cross here, then it really doesn't matter what happens to you here if you are following Christ. There is no, there is nothing here that is going to stop someone who is fully submitted to Christ because their eyes are no longer fixed on the trivial. They're no longer fixed on what happens to this here, they're fixed on the eternal mindedness of it all. They're fixed on the judgment. They're fixed on Christ and his sacrifice. And they're saying, I am a disciple. I am a servant of that man, that God, that perfect example of what I'm supposed to be doing. And so regardless of sickness or health or peril or death or loss, or gain, I will serve him in the desert, in the waters, in the plenty, in the few. Doesn't matter. I have my cross, whether it be to my last breath. Nothing will hinder me that hasn't already been overcome. We forget oftentimes that the battle is won. We just need to be faithful. It's not always easy to be faithful because we are still cloaked in the flesh. We're still draped in this tent. And so that's where the battle comes in. That's where the strive comes in. That's where the, 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 the constant in prayer, the constant in the word. You must put the armor on. You must sharpen the sword. It must always be ready to attack and defend. There must be a constant vigilance between you, your soul, and the flesh. The flesh wants one thing, the soul wants the other. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when it comes in their Father's glory with the holy angels. 
What good is it for someone to gain the whole world but yet lose their soul? The soul is the most valuable thing any of us here will ever deal with, ever, ever, ever. The soul. The, the one thing in this trivial plane that we live in now that will not die. So what does it gain you to play games with the most valuable thing, the most valuable truth that you've ever heard, ever been a part of, but you still want to dabble a little bit in the world, you still want to dabble a little bit in the flesh, you know the truth, you know you need to be picking up your cross daily and denying yourself, stop trying to take the easy way out, stop trying to find a shortcut to where you can still enjoy everything the world has to offer and yet still get heaven, deny yourself, it must be a daily thing. Is not the lamb worthy of the sacrifice of your life? Is he not worthy to get a return for his suffering for what he gave for you? If you're ashamed of Christ, it will show in your life. You will not be bold. You'll be a coward. You will not step up to the plate when the Lord leads you. You'll shy away and say, well, somebody else is more qualified than I am to do that. And when asked if you're a follower of Jesus, you shrink. You're ashamed of him. And please understand that when you pass from this life into the next, if you were ashamed of him here, he'll be ashamed of you on the other side. And there will be no time to repeat. Your cross will have never left. It will have stayed where it remained the entirety of your life. You will have never picked it up. You will have never nailed the flesh and the desires of your heart to the cross day in and day out. As you finally come to the end of your life, they walk you up on that hill. They lay you on the cross and they nail you to it. And to be done with your life, praise God, not... I don't end this life tearfully. I end it cheerfully. What good is life if at the end you're lost for eternity? Huh. Life would seem pretty meaningless to me if I knew that this was it. This is all I'm living for. I'm just living for stuff and things and money and the occasional uh, relationship. That's it. Boy, I would be an empty shell of a person. You must understand what happened on that cross changed things forever. It gave you access to the throne room of God. You are now able to go there on bended knee and bring your request to the one that created you. No need for sacrifice of a lamb or a goat or a bull. You have a high priest that stands to intercede for you because of what he did on the cross. That great atonement on that day. See, today it's watered down. It's milk toast. It's convenient. It's given to those that are wishy-washy. We cater to people that really aren't followers of him. And we umbrella it under the whole, we're trying to lead people to Christ. Well, you're doing a poor job because you're catering to the carnal man and woman in hopes to keep them here. Well, I promise you, if you, kept, if you led them here with carnal means, you'll have to keep them here with carnal means. It is not enough to try to cater to them. That is weak. That is faithless. That is catering. That's tickling the ears. That is, that is not going to do anything. You're harming them and you're sending a multitude of them to hell by, by acting as though they're saved when truly they've never, ever followed Christ or submitted their life to him. You just want them in the building. Preach Christ to them. Preach the cross daily in their life. 
let's let's go to Galatians 2 19 through 21 go to Galatians 2 19 through 21 I wish I could be in front of whoever watches this to commune with you. I, I, I guess this is the only option we have at this point. I, I'd love to meet some of you or, or hear from some of you. I, I know that this is where I've been called or where this is where I've been led, but there has there is an emptiness to it in, as far as the relationship-wise goes. And maybe this is how it felt writing letters back then when Paul and Peter wrote letters they never really got to interact it was just kind of sent and so maybe this is kind of a virtual letter so I hope you read it I hope you hear it I hope you get in your word Galatians 2 19 through 21 for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. See, the law was meant to point you to your sin it was never meant to save you from it. It was that you would acknowledge that you are a sinner and repent of your sin and acknowledge that you are not perfect and hopefully it would bring you to a place of death to pride and death to arrogance knowing that the crushing weight of the law was always upon you to know that you were not good enough to save yourself, nor was the law designed to save you. And that there was always a hope in the Messiah to come and be crucified and to die for your sins. And this has happened now. And we take it ignorantly for granted by what we do, by the liberties we take, by so many professing Christians in this nation that casually go about their day-to-day -day and engage in what the pagans engage in. It says, I died. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It is no longer you and what you want. It is Christ engaging with you now. He's giving you the strength. He's giving you the words. He's giving you your direction. You're no longer taking direction autonomously you're taking direction as a servant where would you have me go the life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God life by faith the cross it was all ended at the cross so that you could live and the life you live now, you live by faith that the Son of God will make good on what he said he was going to do. You put your faith in Christ Jesus because he is the creator. He is the Son of God. And it is his spirit that indwells you if you are truly his followers. So let me be very clear here. It's not enough for you to go to church and put tithe in the offering and say, oh, I love Jesus. If you do not live it out, it is nothing. It is empty words. You are just a wave tossed by the ocean or a tree blown in the wind. That's just where you go to get your religion done. And then you go back and you slip back into the herd of goats. See, I believe there's a multitude of people in the church today that are goats. But we can't pull them up. We can't pull the, the weeds up because you'd pull up the wheat with it as well. No, we must wait patiently for the Lord to return and for his angels to come and separate the good from the bad. That's why we must be so discerning. There are a multitude of people that come in Sunday morning that never deny themselves, that never struggle 
with their flesh. They just give in to it. They never take their cross up. They never proclaim the gospel of Christ. They never do any of these things. They just want to feel good on, the, on Sunday so they can go about their week as a pagan. They are no more of a Christian than an atheist is a Christian. In my, in my thoughts, they're actually a bit worse because they claim something that they're not. An atheist is very clear on what he is or she is. They're under no delusion. The carnal Christian is under a delusion. They believe to be saved. They believe to be followers of Christ, but they're not. And in my mind, that's worse. Because they don't know what they are. They don't know what spirit they're of. And as it says here in Galatians, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ gained for nothing. Christ had to come. He was the fulfillment of the law. We look to Christ, not the works of the law. We do not look at uh, how good we are. We do not measure up and we do not check a box and we do not pile it up in the inbox to say, I'm almost there, a couple more rungs. You're lost. What it is is a full, total submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Saying, not my will, but thy will. Because it's a dangerous thing to harden your hearts if the Spirit would call you. Because I feel like a lot of you out there have probably done that. And now you've heard, instead of you saying, not my will, but thy will, the Lord has looked at you and said, okay, then your will be done. And he has let you go your own way. And many of you speak like you are followers of Christ, but you live as though you're not. The cross. Pick it up. Put it on your shoulder. And let it be a constant reminder of who you serve. What happened that glorious day? When the blood and water flowed forth. And he looked up to heaven and said, It is finished. It is finished. Now it's our job to follow him, to spread the good news, to be a constant example of who Christ is and what it looks like to follow Christ. There's way too many examples of what it looks like not to follow Christ, either in the pagan world or in the church. You have examples in both areas of what it looks like not to follow Christ. We need more examples from the youth and from the elderly what it looks like to follow Christ. Why are we so timid? Why do we care so much of what the world looks at us and how they view us? It shouldn't matter. Amen? Why, are you, why aren't you more concerned of the one that's going to judge you for all eternity what he thinks about you and how he is viewing your conduct day in and day out? Because it is all being recorded. Let's go to uh, Colossians 2. 6 through 16. Let's go there. Colossians 2, 6 through 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility or the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual minds. They have lost connection from the, with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. I'm 
sorry. I, let me see here. What did I say? Colossians 2. Oh, I'm sorry. I read the wrong, wrong bit here. Um, forgive me. Uh, 6 through 16. I read uh, 16 through 20. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in the bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head of every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands, your whole self ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the workings of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us of our, all, all our sins, having canceled the charge of our, of our legal indebtedness which stood against us, condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. The cross. The cross. Now listen to this. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human traditions and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. There is always going to be someone that tries to add something to the word. Or they try to twist it into either um, using you for profit, trying to feed off of you financially, or they may be trying to lead you astray. Maybe they like the fact that... Um, there's a large crowd gathering and they, can, they have an agenda and they're going to kind of twist it. A lot of cults do that. That is a very cult thought process there uh, of getting people. The Mormons do it and the Jehovah's Witnesses do it and it's all built around Christ, but it's, it's cultic. It's not rooted in scripture. It's twisted. It's, it's, it's worldly. It's not right. And so as you go on in this particular scripture, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not produced, per, um, performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh. You were cut. You were, it was taken off. Your old desires fell away and your new desires were put on in Christ. You ever notice when you finally come to Christ and it's a, it's a big deal and the things that you used to love to do you no longer like to do and they slowly kind of came off of you? You ever notice that? I have. I've noticed that. And it is like a circumcision has, has taken place over your whole body, over your whole flesh. And it, things have just been cut off. You used to find joy in this and find a, 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 a lot of love in here. It was cut off because it was hindering your walk with Christ. And so you were pruned so you could produce more fruit because everything that had been done has been done for you. And it is now your turn in this span of eternity to produce fruit for the one who sets you free. Has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. From birth, you were in debt. You inherited Adam's debt of sin at birth. And it, was, it is going to be uh, uh, called upon of you to pay it. And you can never pay it. You can never pay it. That's what Christ came to undo the first sin. He came to give you a way out to clear that debt. You got it at birth. Sin nature. You didn't oops a daisy fall into this debt. It wasn't inherited. It was your sin nature. It was your indebtedness. And Christ gives you freedom of that debt. And he's taken your debt and he's taken one of the nails that pierced him and he has nailed it to that tree. He said, it is finished. It is done. 
There is no more that needs to be paid. The blood of that precious God-man paid it all. It is the most precious truth to me that the blood of Christ ran forth from him into that ground on Golgotha for my sins and for yours. We ought not to take the grace of God for granted and do all of these things. Let me tell you something. Just because you have the freedom to do all things does not mean all things are beneficial. You must be careful. Gird up your loins. Run after Christ. Do not take him for granted. Deny yourself and follow him. Lest you perish along the way. You did not keep your station. You wandered. And you wandered too far and were lost. And do not be led astray by those that would claim to be followers of him. But our trees without fruit pulled up twice dead. Do not follow them. I'm going to close tonight with, a, with a one more passage. Just listen. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphant procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one who is an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life, and who is equal to such a task. Unlike so many, who we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent by God. To those that are being saved, the gospel of Christ is a pleasant aroma because it encourages them they are in the process of complete denial of self. And so to hear the gospel of Christ is an encouragement, a pleasing smell, and a, and a keep going. Do not lose heart. Do not lose faith. But it's an aroma of death to the people that hold on to the world and hold on to the flesh because it is it's a constant conviction of their sin that they have to let go and they don't want to let go. And so they think if they can't have the world and the, and the flesh that they're going to die. And in reality, they will die twice. Go forward and be encouraged. Don't follow false prophets and false teachers. Pick up your cross daily like he did and go the distance. Finish the race and keep the faith. Like always, guys, I love you and God bless.